Okay, great Charles, we're on question 3 now, question 3.1 of the 2017 Northwest uh, prelim paper, paper 1. The graph and diagrams below indicate the effect of strenuous exercise followed by a cold shower on the body temperature of an athlete. Now, you haven't done this question last week when I gave it to you, but now you should have already gone through homeostasis and so I'm going to go through this question. This is part of homeostasis and it's body temperature regulation. Now normally we should have a body temperature of around 36 degrees Celsius. Which of course you would know uh, now or 36,8 or 36,5 there around. Probably in winter we are finding now that it's a bit lower in the mornings. Uh, but because of uh, COVID and the fact that your temperature is taken every morning, you would know what your average body temperature is. And your body will now adjust itself so that it tries to stay at that temperature, which means that when it's colder, your body is going to try and generate more heat and keep more heat in so that you try and stay around that temperature. But when it now gets uh, when it becomes warmer during summer or when it's on a hot day or when you're exercising you will uh, your body will do things so that you can cool down and not go above 37 degrees Celsius which means that you will sweat uh, more blood flow will go towards your skin and this is what the regulation of temperature is about and this is what this question is about so what happens when a person's body temperature starts picking up when he's exposed to strenuous exercise and he's releasing more heat or when he's exposed to very warm temperatures? First thing that will happen is the blood vessels that are close to the skin. So this is the skin we see over here. So this is the surface of the skin and the blood vessels closer to the skin will dilate. We call it vasodilation. More blood will flow to the blood vessels close to the skin and more heat will be released more heat will be released by the skin so second thing that will happen and it's not discussed in this question but close to these blood vessels there might be a sweat gland and the sweat gland is then going to get more blood flow it will produce more sweat and more sweat will evaporate off the surface of the skin more evaporation to, will take place and thus we are going to cool down the body because there's evaporation of the water from the skin or the sweat from the skin on the other hand what could happen when body temperatures are too low when body temperatures are lower or tries to lower when it's cold outside what will happen is that less blood flow uh, will go to the skin. So we're going to have what we call vasoconstriction. The, the blood vessels are going to constrict. They're going to become smaller. They're going to become thinner, uh, less wide. And less blood will flow. As you can see, there's less blood flowing to the skin. There is less blood. Uh, there's less heat being uh, radiated uh, from the skin. And so we try and keep the, the temperature inside the body and not closer to the outside of the body. We try to keep temperature in. Also another thing that will then happen is if we take a look at what's happening to the sweat gland. Less blood will go to the sweat gland. Less sweat will be produced and less evaporation will take place. And th these are things that happen then to try and conserve body temperatures. And here we are try and get rid of extra heat in diagram one. Get rid of extra heat in the body. Now let's take a look at the questions that they are asking. 3.1.1 Which part of the brain responds to the changes in temperature that occur at A and B as seen in the graph? And the part of the body that responds to this is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. 
dead. For how long, 3.142, for how long did the person engage in strenuous exercise? And you've got to read that from the graph. And it's this area over here. And it looks like it's from 5 minutes to 15 minutes. So how long has he been there? 10 minutes. 10 minutes that he was exercising. 3.1.3 Which diagram 1 or 2 would represent the condition of the skin after 15 minutes? So 15 minutes is over there. He's trying to get rid of some extra heat because he's got a lot of heat inside his body. So as we explained, he's going to go through vaso con uh, vasodilation to get rid of that heat. Then, 3.1.4, explain your answer in question 3.1.3. .3. So, now I've got to explain what is happening with the vasodilation. So, the body temperature is above normal. We've seen that. The body temperature over here is above normal. So, the blood vessels will dilate. Blood vessels will dilate. They will widen, vasodilation, we call it, occurred, to bring more blood towards the skin or the surface of the skin. And so more heat is lost. I can see uh, all those arrows showing me that heat is being lost and allowing the body temperature to drop back to normal. And that's what homeostasis is about. We're trying to get everything back to a norm, back to a normal So let's take a look at question 3.2. This has to do with pupillary reflex. And again, please don't confuse pupillary reflex, um, which is going to use the circular and radial muscles of the iris with accommodation. You have to know there's two main processes you have to know when we are discussing the eye. And it's pupillary reflex, controlling the amount of light that goes in and out of the eye. And then we also do accommodation, which has to do with how far or how close um, a, an object is from you that you are viewing. So you can focus properly and see both for uh, something that is far away from you or something that's close to you. This is about pupillary reflex, question 3.2. An investigation was conducted to determine the effect of light intensity on the pupil size, pupil, pupillary reflex of the eye. The pupil size of 32 learners were measured at different distances from uh, with a torch in a dark classroom. The results of the investigation are shown below. So they give you this table. In the table, we are then going to take the light and it's going to be either close to you or far away from you. And then let's take a look at what happens to the pupil size. When it's close to a person, the pupil is very small, 1,5 millimeters when the light is 1 meters away from you. Then, as we move away, as the light moves away, pupil starts increasing so if I draw an eye over here just a quick eye and there's my iris there's my pupil now when the light is close you've got a small pupil as the light moves away I want to get more light in to be able to see properly so the size is going to increase at 5 meters it's going to be 5.2 millimeters in diameter at 7 meters, it's going to be 6.9 millimeters in diameter. And then at 9 meters away from you, it's going to be very big. Your pupil is going to be very big to let lots of light in. And it's going to be 8 millimeters in diameter. Explain the relationship between the light intensity and the diameter of the pupil. So uh, the further away we move, from the light the further the light moves away the less light is available to the eye so as the light intensity decreases as the light intensity as we move away the light intensity decreases the pupil diameter will increase the pupil diameter will increase 
At low light intensities, more light is required to form a clear image. And at high light intensities, the light must be reduced to prevent damage to the back of the eye, damage to the retina. So we have a lot of light coming in, we need to protect the retina and that's when, uh, why my pupil size will be smaller when there's lots of light. Question 3.2.2 Explain why 32 learners were used in the investigation instead of 15 learners. Okay, so the larger the sample size, the more reliable your results. So this question, whenever I, I repeat an investigation, it's about reliability. Reliability. I'm increasing the reliability of my results. Remember to know the difference between reliability and validity. Reliability, if I do it over and over and over again and I get an average, I'm increasing the reliability of the result. Validity is about keeping your uh, controlled variables constant so that I don't have uh, something else affecting the results of my investigation. But this is about reliability because I'm repeating the investigation and getting an average. Then 3.2.3, .3, draw a line graph to represent the data given in the table um, in the table above. So let's quickly take a look at a table and what marks you would be awarded for your graph. So what marks am I getting for my graph? Let's take a look. Firstly, uh, a good heading is going to get you marks, a good heading. Um, and uh, the heading must try and contain both variables that we are talking about. And then for, uh, that's then the caption of the graph, you get one more for Correct type of graph, this is a line graph. Why is it a line graph? Because both variables, both the variables have numbers. They're both numerical and none of them are groupings. So it's numerical variables. So that's why I can draw a line graph. Scale on the X and the Y axis. This must be a scale. Please don't make the mistakes of by writing down the results on the side or at the bottom here. It's got to be a scale. 0, 1, 2 or 0, 2, 4 or 0, 3, 6, 9. And at the bottom, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 0, 2, 4, 6, in this case, as I've done it here, or 0, 3, 6, 9. But it must be a scale. It um, must be equal increments apart when I draw the scale. Each number must be equal in, in increments apart. Then, from there, uh, the label for the X and the Y axis is going to get a mark. So, a label there and a label over there that is going to get you another mark and then for plotting your points if you have all five points correct if you have all five of your points correct one two three four five correctly you will get another mark and lastly uh, i forgot to tell you that for the type of graph the line graph you also get a mark, uh, one mark for the type of graph so typically a graph like this will uh, give you six marks if you swap around the x and the y axis note what they say on the memo here if axes are transposed so swapped around marks will be lost only for labeling so then you lose one mark for the labeling if you swapped your two axes around Question 3.3. .3. Study the diagram below of a sperm cell and then answer the questions that follow. 3.3.1. Identify part A. Okay, so part A, that is your nucleus. So that is your haploid nucleus you have there. That's the nucleus of the sperm cell. And then 3.3.2. .3 Explain two structural adaptations of sperm cells other than the role of part A. So they don't want to know about the haploid nucleus that's going to fuse with the uh, haploid egg cell or haploid ovum. Uh, so what do they want to know? They want to know about the fact that there's lots of mitochondria in there to have energy to swim. They want to know the fact that there's a tail to the sperm so the tail is there to swim with towards the exhale they want to know about the acrosome acrosome 
and inside the acrosome you have some digestive enzymes and these digestive enzymes is going to help break the outside membrane of the ovum when it reaches it so that it can penetrate and the nucleus can be released into the ovum. So mitochondria, tail for swimming, acrosome with enzymes, those are the main three things. You will then get um, two marks for any two rolls that you give between these three points. Question 3.4 Food security exists when all people at all times are able to get safe and nutritious food. This is people memorize this sentence like a parrot. This is the definition for food security. And sometimes they can ask this definition for food security. They can give you the phrase and you're going to say, that's food security, that's going to get you one mark. Or they can say to you, give us the definition for food security and you're going to say that and it can count. This definition can count up to three marks. It can get you up to three marks in the exam. So please study this definition here very carefully and know it off by heart. Then, the food must be suitable for their dietary needs. State two factors that consider for, uh, uh, to consider for food to be suitable for a person's dietary needs. Okay, so um, our dietary needs differ from our age, our stage of life, the amount of activity that we do, the amount of exercise, if I exercise more, if, I, if I'm more active, I need more food. And then, of course, there's also cultural differences or religious differences in the food that we eat, You uh, different diets that you might, um, might eat. Then, question 3.4.2. Suggest four solutions to the problem of food security in South Africa. Okay, so... A uh, big problem with food security is that overpopulation. So if we practice birth control, have fewer children, smaller families, then we'll have more food available for everybody. Secondly, don't waste food. Lots of food gets wasted. Uh, so it's, if we take a look at worldwide, we might have enough food for everybody on earth, but it's unevenly distributed and some people are wasting food and other people don't have food. So your mom was right when she said to you, please eat your food, um, other people don't have food. Then, grow, uh, uh, if you grow your own vegetables, um, if you grow your own vegetable garden, it can solve a big part of our food security problems. Uh, we can plant genetically engineered food because they have higher yield, improved. Question 3.5. So the diagram below illustrates parts of the human ear. State the function of part C, that is your eustachian tube, your eustachian tube, and your eustachian tube is there to equalize pressure on both sides of my tympanic membrane. So the pressure from the outer ear and the middle ear on the tympanic membrane and it equalizes out the pressure on the tympanic membrane which sits over there which divides the outer ear and the middle ear 3.5.2 Describe the sequence of events that occur in the hearing process once parts B vibrate Okay, so uh, those are my ossicles um, uh, but we're not discussing the ossicles. We're not discussing the, the incus, malleus, and staple. Uh, we are discussing what happens after that vibration happens. So what happens after that vibration is my oval window will start to uh, vibrate. Once the oval window vibrates, we're going to have pressure of this liquid on the inside going into the cochlea here. We're going to have uh, waves in the cochlea. Remember there's liquid on inside there and there's going to be waves in that liquid that's in the cochlea. Then there will be a stimulation of the organ of corti. 
that's inside of my cochlea which converts the stimulus into nerve impulses the stimulus will be converted into the nerve impulses and then it transmits that stimulus via the auditory nerve to where to the cerebrum to the cerebrum that observes it be careful for the ear because balancing goes to the cerebellum but hearing goes to the cerebrum in terms of the ear's function question 3.5.3 .3. explain the consequences of ear for hearing if the wax plug is formed in part a if a wax plug so if there's wax sitting there if there's wax sitting over not, not in the middle ear in the out, outer ear if there's wax sitting there then it disturbs the movement of air going into the ear and then the tympanic membrane our tympanic membrane will not be able to vibrate so there will be no vibration of the tympanic membrane and weaker sound waves will be transferred uh, will be transferred to the inner ear but hearing will be impaired so we can't if there's no vibration happening then we can't have hearing 